So hello everyone. I'm Jonah Lacqua. I am Executive Director of the History Project. We are Boston's LGBTQ community archives and I'm so happy to welcome you here tonight to our virtual Out of the Archive series. Uh, we are here most Thursday nights, so if you're interested in queer history, uh, make sure that you are on our email list and following us on social media. Um, as I sort of teased last time we got together, we are uh, gearing up for something very special and exciting in October. So make sure you are following us. Um, so my plugs before we get to tonight's conversation with Dr. Sheffield are, one, if you haven't already done it, uh, please look around you, um, look at your personal history and submit something to our hashtag Queer Archives at Home project. It's a crowdsourced digital archives of pictures, videos, stories, photos, buttons, t-shirts, uh, nothing explicit yet, but we're still going. Um, but it really tells the story of our community um, and is super easy to contribute to. So I'll drop a link to that in the chat and you'll, you'll see that link in our emails. And my second plug is for your support. First of all, thank you to everyone who's already donated to the History Project. Uh, we appreciate your support at any level and any donation in any amount really helps us to uh, document, preserve, and share Boston's LGBTQ history, um, especially recurring donations of any size. Those give us security to take long-term steps towards a sustainable future for the archives and for queer history in the Boston area. And those are my plugs. Now to introduce tonight's uh, conversant, narrator, interview narrator, um, Dr. Rebecca Sheffield. Uh, Dr. Sheffield is a senior policy advisor for the Archives of Ontario and a member of the Record Keeping Strategies Unit. She's taught at Simmons School of Library and Information Science in Boston and at the University of Toronto iSchool. She's previously served as Executive Director of the Archives, Canada's LGBT I'm Archives. Yeah. I always want to add the cue. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up, uh, heads. So the archives, um, Canada's LGBTQ2 plus archives, which was formerly known as the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Archives, where she began as a volunteer archivist in 2007. Rebecca holds a graduate degree in information studies with a specialization in archives and records management. She completed her PhD at University of Toronto's iSchool in collaboration with the Mark S. Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, before we start, um, I just wanted to do a land acknowledgement. I wanted to acknowledge that I'm physically located tonight in Hamilton, Ontario, which is a, a small city just on the underside of a horseshoe of Lake Ontario uh, across from Toronto. And it's on the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. And this land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the, and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. So I often think of this covenant when I'm out and about in the city or taking in the scenic waterfalls of Hamilton. It's what we're known for and the escarpment like Niagara Falls. Earlier this week, as the smoke from the California wildfires gave us this incredible sunset, I thought even more about the importance of this covenant. So I acknowledge this land that I live on and that gives me so much. And I hope you'll take a moment to reflect on the people who lived and continue to live in your neighborhoods as well. So with that, let's talk. Thank you. Um, so my first question for you, my first question in this conversation, and I should mention to, to everyone who's here tonight, our plan is to, um, basically go through a, a list of questions um, about Rebecca's work and career um, and her new book, Documenting Rebellions. And then we'll have time for audience questions toward the end of our, our hour together. So um, if you do have questions throughout the, the conversation though, please put them in the chat and then we'll kind of open it up and I'll let you unmute yourselves later on. So um, my first question is sort of a, a warm up background question. So in your bio, you became a volunteer archivist in 2007 at the Archives in Canada. Um, was that your first foray into working in queer archives? How did you get into the queer archives business? Well, I've always wanted to be a professional queer, so I guess that helped. 
um, I started out doing, um, I started out in a career in publishing, actually, and I worked for uh, a copyright licensing agency, and I worked for a feminist press, and then I actually worked in um, corporate communications. I wrote books in Korea for three years. When I came back to Canada uh, to do a library studies degree, one of my friends actually invited me to come to a volunteer orientation night at what was then the CLGA or the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. And my first reaction was, there's a gay archives? I had no idea. I'd actually lived in and around Toronto for several years and had not realized that this kind of thing existed. So if you actually read parts of my book, I go into the story of, you know, first year library school student coming into the space, realizing I was surrounded by what seemed like a gay pack rat. Um, it was just a really brilliant, fun, um, kinetic kind of experience. And then meeting one of the longtime volunteers who plays a large role in, in my book actually, um, and sitting down with him and learning about the collections and just, you know, at that moment, I think Joan Nestle says this as well, that archives can be seductive. And so being really seduced by the archives. And, you know, I, I had a lot of passion maybe 15 years ago <laughs> that has made me tired now. But at the time, I had a lot of time to give. I had a lot of volunteer time and a lot of time. Um, so I soon found myself volunteering, then I chaired the Community Engagement Committee, which did a lot of the outreach and advocacy work, including um, some fundraising, mostly friendraising. And then after a while, I just had hung around so much that somebody offered me a job. Um, the first position I had was a um, government funded position as a digital archivist, and then I grew into executive director from there. Yeah, so long, long time it took to get into that position. So it's just funny, um, on a personal note, anyone who knows my personal history, I started as a volunteer at the History Project and then slowly took over. <laughs> so it seems like there might be a, a queer archivist handbook that uh, we should be writing about how to work in community archives. <laughs> um, so let's talk about documenting rebellion. So your book came out um, this spring, I believe, yeah. Officially, I remember the launch. January, February, it came out. Things mm -hmm. sort of went sideways in March. We were supposed to have a number of launches, including one in Boston, uh, and it just didn't happen. So the book has been slowly finding its way into people's um, mailboxes or uh, online. I think parts of it are online. Um, but yeah, it came out in, in 2020. But it's a 10 year project. It started out as my you know, seeing your paper in my master's degree was around gay archives or queer archives. Um, it grew into my doctoral studies and then it grew into a dissertation and then from there it grew into a book. So it took about 10 years to create that book. And I think um, now it really is a personal story, even though it is uh, case studies or kind of scholarly or theoretically um, supported, I think it really is my story of my experience with these four organizations that I looked at. Yeah, and so I think since most of us, I don't know about the audience, my copy is still in the mail. Um, and and I, I think uh, that may be true of other folks in the audience um, who haven't had the chance to read it yet. Can you tell me about, um, so I'm interested both in sort of your story coming into the book, but also the archives that you focused on within the book itself. Yeah. So you can take that question either direction. Yeah, I really feel like the, the organizations that I spent time with are really the main characters in this story. So I, I chose to do uh, four so that I would have some kind of comparison or storytelling between the four of them, but they're also four very different organizations. So I looked at the CLGA, what is now the archives, and that really is the, um, my home base. So a lot of my comparisons, my, my um, storytelling comes out of the CLGA's history. I then thought, well, you know, the next kind of closest organization within North America is the One Archives in Los Angeles. 
it's actually about 20 to 30 years older than the CLGA. It has quite a history, uh, but it, it was predominantly um, run and championed by a small group of, of white cis gay men. And so it has a very similar history to the CLGA. So I also wanted to look at kind of their counterparts, which is lesbian archives. And um, I think that the most obvious um, collection to look at is the Lesbian History Archives in Brooklyn. That was really one of the earliest and remains one of the most um, uh, important collections in North America, if not the world, around lesbian identity. And of course, Joan Nessel and Polly Thistlethwaite and others have written about the archives. So it was, uh, it was a clear um, person to include in this. And then I started looking for another archives. And I, I actually attended two conferences in Los Angeles. The first of which is maybe some of your participants here know the Alms Conference, the Archives, Libraries, Museums, Special Collections Conference around LGBTQ subjects, so LGBTQ alms. And I attended that conference and at that conference, the uh, Mazer Lesbian Archives, which is located in West Hollywood, was making an announcement that they were donating uh, nearly 90 of their collections to UCLA in this really critical and important and innovative partnership that they had forged with the UCLA um, library, special collections library. And so at that moment, I knew that I needed to include the Mazer archives, but the geopolitics and the personalities and also the various um, identity politics play such an important role in how different, but also how similar these collections can be. So the CLJ and the one fairly aligned with what I would call liberal gay and lesbian rights movements over time, even though the CLGA started and continues to have a legacy of gay liberation. It really um, has kind of cleaved on to gay rights as part of its identity. Same with the one, it actually started, you know, by the one institute and also another collector, um, really centered in homophile organizations and then later gay liberation and then after that gay rights movements. The two lesbian collections are really um, tied to lesbian feminism and in some cases lesbian separatism. So they have very different personalities and the book offers a historical glimpse at who was there, how did they start, what were some of their challenges, um, what did they collect, what do they um, symbolize for the people who use them? And where are they at at this critical juncture when both the One and the Mazer have partnerships? Well, now the One is actually owned wholly by USC in LA. And um, others that remain autonomous as a political stance, where does that leave us in terms of sustainability? So the rest of the book looks at those questions of sustainability. Where do we go from here? So the, the book is titled Documenting Rebellions, but the subtitle is actually uh, Lesbian and Gay Archives in Queer Times. Excellent. And so I'm curious, so you mentioned um, CLGA 1, Lesbian History and Mazer. Were there any other queer archives that you considered, and I know that you, you spent some time with the History Project in Boston. Um, where else did you think of? Um, who else did you talk to? Well, you know, ambitious um, doctoral committees want you to do like 10 to 15 case studies. And so we had identified a number of collections around North America, and in fact, the world that we could have included. Um, eventually, it becomes a feasibility issue. Like, can you actually get to these places and do a good job? Um, and so we narrowed it to four, but there are some that I really wish that we would have been able to include. Um, there is a, a lesbian archives in Ohio that seems absolutely fascinating to me and I've never been able to, to really connect with them and I'd still like to, they seem to be active at least online. At the time, um, KJ Rawson was establishing the Digital Transgender Archives, and I really considered including uh, the DTA in this study. But in some cases, it really didn't 
fit the case study mold that I was looking for, which was a physical collection that had lasted independently over time. All four of the, the organizations that I looked at started as independent community uh, archives, and the DTA is, is really housed within KJ Rawson's um, academic or institutional affiliation. It's a little bit different. Um, but I think the one, the, the dark horse was actually the, the Chicago Leather Museum and Archives. And ultimately it wasn't included because I couldn't tie a neat bow around the identity of lesbian and gay with regard to the leather archives. Right? It's a much broader identity set than that in some ways. So we couldn't include it. But I will say that I had learned a tremendous amount from the archivists there and the, the people involved that helped me really understand the concept of how you sustain an organization like this through time. Excellent. And that's, and, uh, so Charles Kaminsky, who I believe is with Lambda, uh, mentioned University of Victoria Trans Archives. Um, I believe I saw somebody from Philly. I think Bob Skiba is here. I'm sorry to call you up, Bob. Um, History Project. Um, but there are so many community queer archives because I think a lot of it's, it's people trying to document their own history. And um, so the, the next question on the list actually gets at that word and that idea of documenting a rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you document something that is ephemeral? And, you know, what is the need for, and again, this is probably a second follow-up question, but what's the need for um, community agency over its own history and collection? Sure. Well, let me tackle the, the first part of that. Uh, it, someone has asked me before whether documentation, which is really formalizing or putting something fixed on paper, if you will, isn't really... Um, uh, con it contradicts the idea of rebellion, which is trying to break out of this fixed identity or this fixed mold. And I'm, I don't think that it is in this case. I think what happens is that record keeping has been central to communities forever. Um, you know, just because we call things archives now doesn't mean that there weren't record keeping and memory practices since the beginning of humanity. And so the way that we choose to remember in this culture at this moment is through written word. Um, although I would argue that it's moving much more visual and much more towards video and film. Um, however, during the 1950s to the 1970s, when these organizations began, it was a time of kind of nascent coalescing groups. They had been around for a long time, but they were finally coming together um, and producing material, document, uh, material culture was coming out of these movements. So think of the homophile uh, movement in the United States. There was a moment in which laws actually changed that allowed the postal system to mail out gay and lesbian material. And so at that point, things like newsletters, books, serials, journals could actually be sent across the country without um, causing the, the sender to you know, be in a criminal position. And so it opened up a lot more textual communication. Well, that textual communication became what we know as gay press at some point. So there was a collateral uh, that came out of um, this, this movement. Um, same in Canada, where there were a number of changes to the criminal code that made it a little bit easier for particularly gay men to meet, to uh, mobilize, um, to produce things, and to be a bit more open. This happened around 1969, 1970, and so there was material culture. And so that material culture was critical for building a sense of shared heritage that led to the mobilization of a movement. And so those documents are evidence of that work. And at some point, the people within these movements, or maybe even on the fringe of these movements, if you'll forgive that turn of phrase, um, actually started to look at the collateral, the material that came out of the movements as, we better save this. And so, you know, we can talk about how movements get documented 
think about how important that evidence is to understand the movement, but to also further the movement. And so in some ways, documenting rebellions, you can't have a rebellion without a document of it. Nobody will ever know about it. Uh, and there's a couple of great articles about Stonewall, for example. The reason why Stonewall becomes the touch point for gay liberation is that you, it was actually written about, it was documented, people could repeat that kind of thing over and over again, they could write more about it, and so it be became memorable. And that's one of the reasons why it's still considered the touchstone, even though we know that all sorts of rebellions happened before um, that may not have been as well documented. Did you, and this is kind of a, a personal question, did you think about the tension between those those words when you came up with the title, or is this just something that... No, I, think I, didn't, a... I didn't at all. Um, I actually, someone asked me that question, and I started to really consider it, but um, it's a quote. It's actually, um, if you look in the, the front part of the book, let's see if I can find it quickly. It's... Um, it's Susan Brown Miller, and she says, I was not there at the beginning, few people were, and although I can speak with confidence of a beginning of certain documented rebellions sparked by a handful of visionaries with stubborn courage, there were antecedents to those rebellions and antecedents to the antecedents. So she talks about rebellions getting to a boiling point until they are finally documented, and those documents serve as proof that something happened. There was a second part to your question that I've now forgotten. Oh, it was um, sort of a, a broader question about um, the ability of the community to, and I'm talking to the queer community sort of generally, um, what is the importance of the documenting process laying within the community or being owned by the community or accessed by the community? Yeah. I think one of the hallmarks of, of community archiving is that you can't really tie a bow around what is the community archives. It could look like totally different things. It could look like a blog. It could look like an Instagram account. It could look like an archives, as we think of them, uh, dusty papers. Um, but really, when you try and break down what it is that makes an archives a community archives is kind of a few characteristics. One is that community participates in the creation of that archives uh, in some way, form, or shape, um, and that it, it has a, a vested interest in remaining autonomous. And so this is why it's such an interesting moment to write about lesbian and gay archives because a lot of these collections have become almost too big to handle by a small group, or the champions who've been working with those collections for sometimes 40 or 50 years are nearing retirement and in some cases death. And so passing on, passing the torch was really critical to gay and lesbian archives. But in some cases, there might not have been anybody to pick up that torch and that's why public libraries, that's why academic or college archives, um, in some cases public archives, have stepped in or have greatly benefited from collecting the materials that the community actually created. Um, but autonomy was really critical. And I think that goes back to the question of why you start one of these things, which is that the mainstream archives or memory or um, heritage institution doesn't accurately or adequately reflect your experiences as an individual or a community, you may choose to develop your own. So I have a question about, about the archives that you looked at, what about the, the collections that you looked at? And you had mentioned that um, uh, CGLA and one both had sort of a white male cisgender gay focus. Um, did you find diversity within these collections? Did you find that they were adequately 
uh, I don't know if I want to say adequately, but if they were accurately maybe um, representing the, the communities who are all part of the LGBTQ community, um, if there were similarities or, or was one doing something differently? Um, I think in the case of the CLGA, the, the, the geopolitics of Toronto in 1970 were very different than they are today. So I went back and looked at some statistics and it was, you know, the Canada statistics would, would say that about 85% of people living in and around the Toronto area identified as Caucasian. So we're already talking about a fairly homogenous culture, but also it was not. And so we know that there were people of color, there were black people, there were indigenous people who were involved in queer communities um, for as long as we know, right? But in some cases, those communities were either marginalized geographically to slightly outside the urban core, or they became marginalized through politics because um, there was a movement of gay liberation that was predominantly led by a small group of gay white men. So I think the, what happens in collecting at a community level is that you collect what you are and you are what you collect. And so through no real um, conscious malice, what ended up happening is that, you know, birds of a feather flock together. And so this group of men that started the archives collected what they knew, what they encountered, what they thought of as gay liberation. And although there was an understanding that they should and they were collecting on the, uh, you know, the broadest possible mandate of what was gay at the time, and then later lesbian, um, they still failed to really encounter those people that they didn't consider part of the community. Um, or in some cases, there's stories of, of them, um, you know, referring women donors to uh, feminist archives instead of a gay archives because the content that they were bringing in was so closely tied to things like women's dances or take back the night marches or women's marches that the gay archives felt that they would be better served at the, the women's archives down the street. And so in some cases there might have been overt sexism or racism but in most cases it was sort of systematically embed into who they were and what they did um, in this kind of homogenous culture. And so as a result, the collections reflect them and their orientations and their interests. How you overcome that when you're faced with um, demands of urgent representation um, is, is something very interesting and as yet to be determined. Uh, they added the name lesbian or the word lesbian to the name of the organization only in the early 90s. So you have, um, you know, 20 years of collecting under the name Gay Archives. And now the name has changed as of um, last year to the Archives with a Q. Uh, and the, the subtitle or tagline is, is like Canada's LGBTQ plus Archives. It's not clear whether all of the identities under that spectrum are fully appropriately or adequately reflected. Um, and certainly, you know, archives collect historical material, so it would take a long time of collecting before we ever balanced out any kind of bias in the collection. That said, you asked about diversity. It's in there. It's already in there. But I think you have to take diversity at its greatest possible definition. You have stories of people that come from all sorts of orientation in there but they're not necessarily the ones that were remembered or were, were well described or that we know anything about. And they might have come into the archives through a second donor or a third party. Um, or there might be some really great collections in there. Um, there's one in particular at the CLJ, for example, around um, South Asian uh, queer group that existed in Toronto for decades, still continues to exist. And so it's a matter of going into that collection and really celebrating those stories that are there. I don't know if I wanna speak about the one, I found the one to be um, a mixture of both. Um, it's actually the one archives, 
is actually a number of collections that have been um, kind of collapsed in on each other over the years. And so I would say that the collection that Jim Kepner kept in his own house was probably much more diverse because he was an interested person in diverse um, uh, collections, including science fiction, anarchism, Marxism, you name it, it's in there compared with the one which was actually a quite um, capital C conservative collection uh, that was run by a very different group of people. And they were only brought together you know, decades after they were founded. Yeah, and it, well, I think it's interesting to consider um, within, I mean, the multiple identities and interests of people who identify as queer and people who are collectors of queer material. And it's something that, um, you know, we've talked about in the abstract at the History Project, sort of, um, if somebody comes to you with a collection and they are a Black lesbian artist who went to this specific school, where does the collection fit? Yeah. And, and where do they feel that their work fits? And, and how do they feel within the community with the History Project with the best repository for all of those materials, some of those materials? And, and it's sort of, um, I think for, for those of you in the audience who are not uh, embroiled in uh, archives theory and conversations, that's something that I think acquisitions archivists are talking about and thinking about in ways in which, you know, you can partner with or point people to other resources that document the community beyond the community archive. Um, so with your book, and actually that's a, a uh, pretty good segue. Um, who's the, the intended audience for your book? Ah, interesting. Well, you know, the intended audience of a dissertation is your committee. Um, so it very rarely gets read beyond that. But, but pulling out this work and, and recreating it in a monograph um, was always something that I had hoped or intended to do. And in, in the case of, of this project, I was able to actually strip out the vast majority of the, the academic talk, the language is gone. Um, I had the great opportunity of sitting and rewriting this thing in hopefully clear, plain language. Um, there's no method section, so don't worry about it. The literature review is small, um, but the, the case studies are really written for anyone interested in the history of these organizations, and hopefully it's a light touch on the theory. Uh, I, I attempt to tell this as a narrative more than a social science project. Uh, it really is a story and that's what I wanted to tell. I mean, God, the histories of these places are just filled with, with um, politics and, and, and sex and lives and people and you just got to get in there and dig in there. And so even though the book is written for a scholarly press, it's written for the greatest audience that I possibly could within that context. So I hope that, you know, the, the curious um, people who want saucy gossip about, you know, the Herstory archives or something will pick it up and have a read. Um, but I think it's also written as a love letter to these collections. So I really wanted to celebrate the, the complexity of these places and the people who've run them for so long, because we're also at a moment where they are being hotly critiqued. And so you'll see if you read the introduction, and I've actually posted it to my website, so you should be able to download it and read uh, an uncorrected proof of it um, without having to buy the book, but please buy the book. Uh, if you read that, you'll see that, that the whole journey starts one night when I'm sitting at a talk much like this, but in person at the CLGA. And the talk is about um, representation in the archives. And a very prominent cultural theorist sort of announced to a room of people that the queer archives was a failure. And I knew what she was talking about because I've read queer arts, I've read failure, I've read all of these books. Um, and I knew that what she was saying is that it could never possibly represent everything. It could never possibly live up to the aspirational collecting mandate that it had, which was Canada's lesbian and gay archives. Um, so first of all, Canada's a huge scope. Second of all, how do you fit lesbians in there? You know, there's a lot to accomplish in that. 
But I looked around the room and I saw, you know, two or three older men who had been literally filing documents away in their spare time so that this place existed. I watched their whole bodies sink after being called a failure. And so my work for them was to try and put their work and their blood, sweat, and tears, sometimes literally, into context of respect, but also where do we go from here? So it was not a critical look necessarily. It was more about telling the story and capturing the histories of this organization and other organizations that haven't been so good at telling their own histories. Um, we say the cobbler's children have poor shoes. Um, archives are really bad at telling their own stories and allowing whatever critique to then have to grapple with the actual material resources, labor, and time that it took to build these things. It's really easy to tear things down, but it's not easy to build them. And in, in many cases, these folks spent their whole lives building something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi, Libby. Hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm muting you. <laughs> uh, Libby Bouvier. To- <laughs> Libby can ask questions in a minute, but um, so so Libby Bouvier is a uh, our resident national treasure um of the the history project, and you've been with us since the beginning in in 1980, and and I think can probably really relate to this picture you're you're painting of the people who created the archives. And I was smiling along at archivists are bad at record keeping because it's very true. Um, at our own records, we're great at keeping other people's records, um, but our own is a little bit harder. Um, so I wonder, and and you mentioned this, it is an interesting time. There is a, a turning point, especially in terms of queer archives and either partnering with institutions or donating materials to institutions or figuring out ways in which you can collaborate, which I think you could probably describe the um, transgender digital archives in a lot of ways as a collaboration of a lot of archives and collections, both academic and scholarly and institutional to put that kind of um, uh, word on it and and more community focused collections. Do you see, thinking about your case studies, where do you see the future of this this turning point going? Yeah, I I have some ideas about that. I think that's an open-ended question. There's a lot of dependencies. I think this particular moment we're in with COVID has also shown us the extent to which digital can can work and cannot work for some cases as well. Um, So, The Digital Transgender Archives is interesting to me because KJ ran into a a challenge in which a lot of material that you could use to explore the history of uh, trans identity, um, trans experiences, is actually held in collections that are not accessible to trans people. And so some of that is in gay lesbian archives and yet had not really been identified as trans. Um, and in some cases, maybe either miss or um, naively um, described as drag. So teasing out those relationships has been really challenging. Um, but also are in private collector's hands where the collector isn't ready to give them up or is not expecting to give them up or might be collected in, in a place that actually has institutional ownership over them. And so what he did, which is incredible, is he built a kind of union catalog. He went to all of these places, built relationships with people in places, and actually didn't just do collecting in the sense that he didn't walk away with boxes or bundles of things, but walked away with bundles and boxes of metadata um, and, and bundles and boxes of digital surrogates. And so he's created this archives that isn't really an archives. It kind of points you to all of the places where this stuff exists. 
Um, I think we need more of that. Um, he's also got his own collections and he's also got his own work, but it's just, it shows you how vast the collecting landscape is across uh, North America. So that's a really interesting way, I think, to approach archives, particularly because moving forward, so much of our histories will be captured only in digital. And we know that those are, they might as well be ephemeral. So developing these, these kinds of digital uh, repositories and digital collections is going to be really critical moving forward. There's also this challenge of no money, no resources, no time, no energy, in a very diverse and different community than what existed 40 years ago. So how do you maintain community rapport development while in the digital? That's something that um, El Chenier is working on at Simon Fraser University with the Archives of Lesbian Oral Testimony, or a lot. It's also a digital archives, much the same um, kind of concept as the digital transgender archives, but in Chenier's case, uh, they've been able to actually um, work with, with researchers and other kinds of, of scholars and sort of uh, amateur historians, the oral historians, and actually um, unearth or save or rescue some materials that would have otherwise been disappeared and bring them together, but they've done so with the institutional support of Simon Fraser. So it becomes part community, but part institution. And I think we'll see a lot more of those relationships moving forward. One reason being that it's incredibly difficult to run a digital archives as a community without institutional support. Um, it just is. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's even difficult to do with the institutional support. Um, but then the other thing is too that, you know, I think the founders of the CLJ or the archives would, would agree that at some point, um, at least some of our identities and some of our history is no longer um, marginalized. It actually is just part of the history of Canada. And so a lot of the things that were never talked about um, are now talked about as early as grade five in some schools. Um, we have gay history. My daughter's in grade six. They will learn gay history this year. Um, and so it's a moment of kind of coming into the mainstream for better or for worse, because we know that that also marginalizes people. Um, but academic and scholarly institutions are really keen to collect this stuff. So we both need them, but they need us. And so we're at this point where I think the future is, is in the negotiations of what those relationships look like. Um, if you think about it, you can now study queer theory, at least, or queer studies um, at any number of institutions across North America. And so if you're going to attract faculty to teach in those areas, you better have special collections that they're interested in looking at. Um, so that's, that's where universities are at. Um, they're swallowing up these kinds of community collections. It's low hanging fruit for collections management and development. So one thing I was thinking of as you were talking actually about um, trans collections within repositories and actually sort of doing these, these larger collaborative institutional projects, I thought immediately of you know, something like the Medical Heritage Library, which um, we're talking about rare books, not, you know, queer ephemera, but um, a number of institutions get together, they pull funds, they hire somebody, and they describe these enormous digitized collections. Um, I'll put out into the universe that we know what our trans collections are, and we want to digitize them, and we have applied for several grants and have not received any of them. So if anyone out there, uh, is interested in learning more, we, we know what the materials are. But I, I think um, the, the real question I have and the, the one that I'm thinking of as we, we should be turning to audience questions soon. So if folks have questions, take a minute to put them in the chat. Um, this idea of no longer being marginalized, but also of the type of materials collected in queer archives or archives that have to do with sexuality and gender identity. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of meandering my way to asking, what are some of the things that you've seen in these collections 
that may not necessarily be what somebody at a, a university archives would pick up, but yeah. are important to, to collect and, and tell the story of these communities and these people. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good question. So I'm going to, I'm going to preface this with one thing first, just a, a, a clarity. Um, so some stories may have been mainstreamed, but many have not. So there's only particular things that the mainstream is interested in. In Canada, at least, we're really interested in the story of same-sex marriage. Like it's somehow the end-all be-all of gay rights. Uh, we've all achieved equality by getting married, apparently. Um, so that story and those narratives, of course that's an important milestone, but that seems to be a preoccupation with some of our mainstream institutions. The other is around particular moments. Um, celebrating last year, there was a, a significant um, omnibus bill that passed uh, in Canada in 1969, so it would have been a significant anniversary last year of that omnibus. It's sometimes referred to as the decriminalization of homosexuality. Uh, we know that that isn't entirely true, that there was still criminalization after that, but it was a significant milestone in which certain sex acts were removed from the criminal code. Now, that history has become part of the mainstream in some ways. And so we tell the story of how Canada has been an accepting nation since 1969. Uh, we know that is not true. But we also know that it is even less true for different kinds of identities. So um, I think our mainstream collecting institutions still do very poorly at intersectionality. So we, we think of gay people as looking and being a certain type of person. And we think of, let's say, Black, Indigenous, or people of color as being certain kinds of people, but we can't ever bring these things together and think that there might be identities in between, and of course that overlap and imbricate and are all sorts of things. So the mainstream is interested in those things that supports its own narrative of what it wants to, to um, be known for. So this is a long-winded answer, but I think what what mainstream wants are journals, serials, newspapers, um, books maybe, photographs, we love photographs, um, some videos, but they're certainly not going to touch the 10,000 homemade, taped from the TV set, porn collection at the CLGA, right? They're certainly not going to delve into any of the literature that's in the rare book library around man-boy love associations. They're certainly not going to look at um, any of the lesbian um, erotica that was done throughout the 80s and 90s. So there are certain things it will touch and certain things it won't. They may also not be interested in some of the bad gays. And I think there's a really great podcast out there right now that's kind of exploring these called Bad Gays. Um, but it's stories of particularly gay men, some, some women, um, who really did awful things like turning in all of their peers to McCarthy during the McCarthy era um, to save their own soul, maybe? We're not sure. So there's some really like atrocious things that gay people have done. And I don't think the mainstream and maybe not the gay community are ready to share those stories out. Um, they're not really interested in trans stories. They're not really comfortable with two-spirit stories. Um, I don't know how popular the term two-spirit is in the States, but it was coined here in Winnipeg um, as meaning indigenous and queer, um, although it's a much more complicated idea than that. But yeah, it's, they're not yet interested in those stories. So it's gonna take time. Um, I would say also they are not interested in artwork and it takes a long time to convince you know a campus archives to collect a 500 portraits of men's genitals which is what the one had in its collection and guess what that artwork is now being shown all over the place and was part of like los angeles collecting galleries the getty commission stuff etc cetera, etc cetera. but it took a long time to convince them to take it Excellent. As I, I'm thinking, uh, one, that was a meandering question on my end. So thank you for answering it so uh, thoughtfully and far more succinctly than I asked it. Um, 
but also I was smiling at the the idea of artwork and that's the sort of things that um things that don't fit into boxes things that are um created to be framed and are not easy to shelve and that sort of yeah I'm just thinking so, so, yeah the materials a fantastic collection of drag costumes in uh, Buffalo in and around the Buffalo area in New York that was actually taken in by University of I think was it anyway it was one of the the state universities in Buffalo now has this collection it's like what do you do with 10,000 drag costumes how do you preserve a scepter? I mean, these are things that are just, like, what do you do with these things? Um, but yet those artifacts are so critical for understanding um, queer communities, pin buttons, t-shirts, all of that stuff, um, which a traditional archives has no idea how to manage, um, let alone wants, because they're not really evidential in the same way that typical records are. So yeah, it can be a bit of a challenge. Great. So I have a question from Harrison in the chat. Um, and again, folks, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat, use the hand raise button. If you have on your video and you want to physically raise your hand, I can unmute you that way too. Um, but Harrison mentions, hi, Rebecca, I was really struck by the story you tell toward the end of your book of collecting the crumpled up papers that Ronaldo Walcott was throwing. Can you say more about your ambivalence to do that? And if you still feel the same way about becoming complicit in a drive to collect against someone's refusal? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question. So to give some, some context, um, there was a large conference that was held in Toronto in uh, 2015, I believe. Um, and one of the speakers was um, Ronaldo Walcott, who's a, a well-known scholar in Toronto. He's um, actually, the, the head of the, the Women's Studies Institute, I believe, at uh, Women and Gender Studies Institute at U of T, um, writes a lot about Black diaspora identity and is very critical of archives as both colonial projects, but also of no value to his community in the way that they are conceptualized by our community. And so he was asked to talk at this um, symposium, and I'm not sure what the intention was um, or, or what the expectations were about what he would talk about, but it was to celebrate um, the, the 50th anniversary of the body politic, uh, which was the, the Gay Liberation News Magazine of Record from about 1971 to uh, the late 80s. And it, it basically was a problematic it was a wonderful publication, but a pro problematic publication in that it published around the idea of gay liberation and that people had the right to choose whatever they wanted. And at one point they had published an art, uh, uh, an ad, uh, they had, a, you know, looking for classif classified ads, looking for love, right? And they would publish these in the back of the magazine. But this particular time they published one that was um, a white man looking for a black houseboy. And that's how it was phrased. And of course, it just landed and uh, it, it produced an incredible amount of tension in the community. Um, black community members were outraged that the, um, that the press would actually publish something that was so obviously racializing and stereotyping um, and then uh, the it was defended as if this is your sexual orientation and proclivity we're not going to prevent you from from pursuing that um, and in the end that ad and the um, controversy surrounding it actually led to probably the closing of that news magazine it it converted into something else called extra which still exists today but the Gay, Gay Liberation magazine really folded at that moment. When Ronaldo Walcott gave his talk, uh, remembering the body politic, he focused on that particular ad. And it was, um, it was a very um, conscious act of refusing to have his words at that moment archived by the CLGA that was there. Um, keep in mind the CLGA's major collections actually come out of the body politic. So there's a relationship there already. 
Uh, and so as he read from his paper, he crumpled it up and threw it at the audience as he was reading. And I had the great pleasure of trying to be the uh, moderator of his panel. And so I'm sitting at the front of the room watching him do this and just being engrossed in this, this performance. It was quite amazing. It was quite impactful. Um, and at the end, I gathered up the pieces of paper and I said, what do you, what do you want me to do with these? I want to find a way to remember this talk. And what's interesting is that as the waning days of my work at the archives. So he said, if you want them for the archives, take them, but don't uncrumple them. So I took them back to the archives. I took his 10 pages of crumpled paper. I put them in a box. I wrote Ronaldo Walcott, accession number this, this date, and put it on the shelf. And then in the description described the incident. And so that was my way of archiving that talk. And what's really interesting is that um, I don't know if you can see this because sometimes the camera doesn't catch it when I'm me. Uh, there, kind of. Yep. Okay, so what's interesting is that this book came out um, and what this book does is it picks up that moment where the conference happened and Ronaldo Walcott gave this performance and this, this really barn burner of a talk. And it, and it creates a whole book out of it, out of this moment of Black people are here, we've always been here. People of color are here, we've always been here. We're part of these histories, why have you kept us out? And so I preserved his talk by sticking it in a box. And they preserved his talk by writing about it, talking about it, creating about it. What's an archives there? Is it the book or is it the crumpled paper? And who's ever gonna access that crumpled paper? And so it's a real story of the tensions between storytelling and the importance of storytelling and this evidence that'll sit in a box that may not ever be accessed in any real way by the community that it's meant to talk to. So I think that's what, what Harrison's getting at is that there's, there's a story here about what does it mean to build memory and to construct memory in this way? Yeah. So that's I good. need to get the book. <laughs> I need to get your book. I also need to get uh, Marvelous Grounds. And um, as I've done for other talks like these, everyone who um, uh, registered tonight will get an email from me. I will put links to these books that we're talking about um, and to the archives that we've talked about as well. So that if you want to look into them yourself or add it to your ever-growing list of things to read, you can. Um, so we have a, a question and a comment from uh, Charles Charles. Um, and then we have one more uh, comment question from Reed. And then I think we'll, we'll begin to close down. Um, Chuck, do you want to ask your question or do you want to, would you like me to read it? Uh, uh, I've unmuted you. you. I've un okay, thank you. Um, great presentation, Rebecca. Um, so I'm board member emeritus of Lambda Archives in San Diego. And I have found, um, this is what I posted, I have found that the more diverse an archive board is, the more that archive seems to seek underrepresented and overlooked communities so that they are engaged to contribute and add to the archives. I also have realized and found to be true that management and, as you use the word storytelling, story, storytelling of these collections they're seeking uh, by representatives of their communities seems to encourage uh, more contributions to the archives. Uh, a lot of um, San Diego communities, whether they're the Kumeya, uh, the native indigenous people, um, uh, the Latinos from Baja California, um, the black community, the Latinx community, want to have a say in, okay, folks, you're taking this, but we want to be part of that storytelling. So I'll mute myself now. Just your thoughts on that. So, so point of disclosure, I had a, a really great one hour cocktail 
party last night with with Joyce Gabiola, who's your new <laughs> executive director and is in fact a graduate of Simmons uh, College uh, Library School. So that was really great. And I'd, and I'd love to keep the conversation going with Joyce and anyone there. Uh, but I think you're bang on. So I think representation starts with representation. Um, you know, congratulations, you have an all white board is not going to do much to build trust and partnership with um, communities who don't identify as white. So um, I do think that representation has to happen throughout an organization. But you, you raise something that actually um, comes, comes up quite often, which is participation. So there needs to be a participatory component of collecting from a community that you are not part of. So if you're reaching out to a community that has felt um, underrepresented or marginalized in your collection, they need to be part of that conversation. They, and that trust around knowing and understanding how they wanna participate is actually gonna take time. It's gonna take a lot of time. And so it can't happen overnight, um, which you know the critics would, would like you to change overnight. And the reality is you can't. Um, but you can do some things um, and you can try and try and try. Now, the other side of this is for communities or individuals who have been marginalized by what I'd call um, white, lesbian and gay archives, why would they want to contribute their materials to you? I mean, you really have to, it's not a selling that you have to do, you really have to show them to demonstrate that you're going to give as much reverence to their collections as you do to those that better represent you. And that's not an easy thing to do. Um, but if you don't do it, then don't be surprised when they turn you down or they go somewhere else. Because that, you know, you gotta build that relationship first. But yeah, representation is key at all levels from the board down to the person that greets you at the door and welcomes you into the reading room. Um, you know, I think this is one of the critical things that I'm watching for with what is now the archives in Toronto is that the name has changed. The name had to change. It had to better reflect the community. It could not remain lesbian and gay archives. However, it's not just the name change. So I'm watching to see, is the queue enough to actually expand the archives? Or how much more work needs to happen from the ground up to make sure that the name is really a reflection of what that archives is doing. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. That's a where I mean, I don't want to say we're all watching Canada, but we're all sort of watching each other. There are things that you can yeah. do for I mean, Canada's watching America right now. Uh, but you know, there are things that you can do in the the name of community and, and diversity that actually has some weight behind it. And there are things that you can do that makes it seem like you're doing that. And there are lots of examples of activism happening right now where how much of it is signaling that you are woke yeah. and how much of it is, is making actual inroads and connections and change. Well, I, I will say one strategy that the archives has done um, since my time there, um, the new ED, Reagan Swanson, does some fantastic work in community um, outreach in order to work with um, people from different communities, she's actually hired them. So she's put her money where her mouth is. And when they hire an archivist to work on a collection, they try to bring someone from that community in to do the processing and the description, even if they have no archival training. So it's, it's about bringing in that perspective and again, the participatory component of archiving, which is more important than knowing, you know, which Hollinger box fits which kind of record, um, because there is an archivist on staff who can guide some of that more um, technical or more professional expertise. That's one of my favorite things about the History Project when I think about queer archives in general, is that the community comes in and works with the materials. And we've had people who are not archivists or people who are retired historians or people who are we had an architect who was pretty amazing um and they learn how to do it and they learn about the community and they might learn about themselves at the same time so we're five minutes over i'm going to ask reed's question 
um, as just sort of a cap on our evening. Sure. And then I'll, I'll release all of you to your 8 p.m. cocktail hour or bed, <laughs> if you may. Um, but uh, Reed asked uh, about, you know, the decision to move community archives into institutions um, must be a difficult decision and contentious. Um, and, uh, you know, he's imagining concerns that future institutions might essentially decide to burn it all or not give access to it or not process it in any kind of timely manner. Um, do you have any stories about that? He says specifically, do you have any dirt on that? There's so much dirt on that. I have an entire chapter of my book on that um, called From Radical Archiving to Special Collections. So you can read all about it. Um, absolutely. And I, I spend most of that chapter talking about two, two particular cases in which institutionalization did not happen. So one is that the CLGA was offered space at University of Toronto campus. And the conversation happened at a time in the history of the archives where they were really broke and they didn't have enough space. And this kind of magical offer came to move them into campus. And yet after months and months and months of negotiating, it really seemed like the only thing the campus could offer on paper as a commitment was a lease in the basement of one of their buildings. And yet the archives would have to pay rent in that space. And so there was a financial reason to not move ahead. But as, as my research kind of discovered was that almost as important as the financial reason was the ideological reason and also the volunteers. Because U of T is a unionized library system, there was concern that if the collection did end up being transferred to legal ownership of the library, that volunteers would no longer be allowed to work with the collections because of labor union rules. And that was the final straw in deciding not to move into this space. Luckily, around the same time these conversations were kind of dwindling, um, a city councilor found them a heritage building and gave it to them for a dollar. That story is also in the book, but that's another long story. And that's where they are today, which is 34 Isabella Street in Toronto. The other is the story of the June Mazer archives, which was invited to join the one at uh, University of Southern California. And after lengthy negotiations backed out, again, financial, very similar story. University wouldn't commit to anything other than an 18 month lease. They said no, but when you look beyond just the financial, the ideological comes out and it was, we are a lesbian separatist collection and we don't wanna be intermingled with the ones collection. And so they had a really difficult time because the one really wanted to conceptualize itself as sort of the one archive to tie them all together. Um, and so there was concern that they would not be able to still have women only hours or lesbian only hours or this or that and, and they didn't want that. So it did not happen and then they ended up being gifted space by the city of West Hollywood, which really came through for them and still does today. Excellent. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much. This has been such an enjoyable, wonderful hour, hour and 10 minutes. Um, thank you to everyone who came here and who's been part of our conversation and those of you putting uh, stories and comments in the chat. Um, I can say Kristen Porter, I see that you're here. Hi, Kristen. We're working on bringing in Kristen's collection of local lesbian events from 98 to 2020. You heard it first. Um, we're so pleased to have you. Like I said, we're here most Thursday evenings. Uh, next week, I think on Wednesday actually, so you'll have to check the email for uh, details. We're partnering with the Mass Bears and Cubs to talk about their history. Um, so it'll be me and a bunch of bears, which is a lot of fun. So again, thank you all for being here. See you again soon. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everyone, have a great night. Okay.